Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 336 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Andy Duncan. He's the author of the short story collections Balutha Hachi and Other Stories and The Potawatomi Giants and Other Stories, as well as the standalone novella The Night Cash. His fiction has received the Nebula Award, the Sturgeon Award, and multiple World Fantasy Awards, and he teaches creative writing at Frostburg State University. And we'll be speaking with him today about his new book, An Agent of Utopia, New and Selected Stories. And now here's our interview with Andy Duncan. All right, so we're here with Andy Duncan. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, and so your new short story collection is called An Agent of Utopia. So what is An Agent of Utopia? <laughs> I guess that's uh, a subjective question. Depends on whom you ask. Uh, in this particular story, it is the emissary sent by the uh, island nation that Sir Thomas More wrote about on a secret mission to the Tower of London to rescue More from the Tower. And uh, and the story tells about what transpires from there. But of course, utopia meaning something different to almost everyone. Uh, when I first wrote down that title back in grad school, an agent of utopia, the title came to me minus the story. <laughs> but the title just seemed so resonant because it made me wonder just what would an agent of utopia look like? And among other things in this story, the agent turns out to be an assassin. So are you a fan of that book, the the Thomas More Utopia? It's a fascinating book. I don't know if I would claim to love it. I first encountered it in uh, in grad school uh, when one encounters so many Renaissance texts. But it is it is a fascinating read. It's one of those books that everyone thinks they know just because they've heard people talking about it or seen riffs on it for so many years. But I do think it, it repays some uh, some reading. It took me some time to read it. I would read a few pages at a time <laughs> over over months. But uh but it is a confoundingly complicated and and uh tongue in cheek and ironic work. There's a there's a great meme on, on social media going around where uh, where uh, the painting of Thomas More says in the speech balloon, you think you know irony? You are like a little baby. <laughs> 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 and that's uh and that's certainly what uh, what Moore's what Moore's book is to the I mean to the extent to which any of the things described about Utopia are things that Moore himself would have endorsed is is endlessly debatable. So, I mean, for people who haven't read Utopia, which I'll confess includes me, what would be some of the basic facts about the story that would be uh, relevant for understanding your story? Well, what, well certainly um, the fact that uh, the point is made that while the Utopians uh, prefer not to go to war with anyone, they view war as barbaric, they are quite okay with hiring it done, with, with hiring mercenaries when they absolutely have to do something, and with things like assassination as statecraft, uh, sort of what we would today call black ops operations, uh, surgical uh, uh, interventions to remove leaders or to uh, deal with things before deal with international conflicts before they ever reach the stage of of war. And of course, in the time and in the regime of Henry VIII, where Moore was working, he well knew that this was not just the stuff of fiction. This was actually how the crowned heads of Europe went at each other all the time, even when their even when their galleons and their armies were not at war. They were they were Walsingham and the others were constantly uh, spying on one another and and uh, and assassinating various operatives and so on and so forth. So so I just thought as as I often do, um, I always look for the point of view that to my mind would be the most interesting and the and the most little seen thus far. 
So I thought, who would who would one of these uh, assassins be? Who would one of these agents of Utopia be? And what would their story be? What would their motivation be? So uh, so that's that's part of how the story worked out in my head. So where did the idea come from to make Thomas Moore himself a character in the story? Well, I thought if he wasn't a character, it would be a dodge. Uh, I could, uh, certainly the agent could have showed up too late. The ship was delayed or something like that. But I thought, no, if the agent is going to find more, then the agent has to find more. But it took a long time for me to get resolved in my head that Moore was actually not going to be a major character. Because initially I had thought there was going to be all these discussions with Moore, uh, all these conversations, all this negotiation, all this philosophical discussion. And I thought, well, that's already been done. That's been done in A Man for All Seasons, and that's been done in, to some extent in, uh, in, in Wolf Hall and so forth. So I decided, well, my interest here is less with Moore than with the agent and with Moore's daughter, Margaret Roper, Meg, uh, uh, Margaret Moore Roper, who was, who was married by that time. And, uh, and so I, uh, uh, I, I get the agent to Moore. There's a vivid scene where the agent meets Moore. And then I'm pretty much done with Moore. Except, of course, for the matter of Moore's head, because Moore's head turned into a character all its own. There's a there's a great deal of uh, uh, li- uh, almost literal skullduggery going on in the story eventually with the severed head of Thomas Moore. And one of my one of my friends of many years, who is uh, much more Catholic than I am anything in terms of religion, uh, heard me reading from this story not long ago. And sidled up to me later and said, uh, just for the record, you realize that to many more is a saint. And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, we will, uh, uh, we will see whether this story strikes people as blasphemy <laughs> or, uh, or as, or as, or as merely silly or as, uh, something in between. So that means he had two confirmed miracles. <laughs> you know that's a very interesting uh uh that's a very uh interesting uh question there um i think uh i i i would have to defer defer to people that know more about the religious side of things uh, yeah. there but uh uh i will say only that in recent years uh the uh the rules have been relaxed a great deal uh as far as uh, canonization and uh and uh, a lot of you know mere mere like conversions and epiphanies are now getting cited as as miracles which to somebody expecting more special effects might be a bit disappointing sort of like great inflation yes perhaps so but uh but i uh but on 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 any uh on uh, any topic concerning religion I can think of uh, millions of people who have more expertise than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that would certainly go for me as well. I don't know if you've ever read uh, Ian M. Banks' Culture series, but this was reminding me of that a little bit in the sense that there's this uto- utopian society, but then they have to do all these awful things outside sure. the society to, to maintain the utopia within. Sure, and we, uh, and we live in one of those utopian societies, right? We're always being we're always being told, and we have been told ever since the dawn of the republic, that uh, that uh, America is the last best hope of freedom. That uh, that this is the place where everybody has a chance to succeed. This is the place where everyone can speak their mind and have all these rights and so forth. And also simultaneously, from the dawn of the republic, uh, ensuring all that has required you know various wet work against countless enemies, external and internal, <laughs> and then who those enemies are seems to vary over time. You know, at one time it was, it was, uh, it was, uh, you know, the French, you know, uh, and, uh, but, uh, yes, uh, so, so these are not just matters of, of, of fiction. It's easy to go finding all the utopias and dystopias and, and ambiguous utopias, which is what Le Guin called uh, 
uh, the one in uh, the dispossessed. Um, but uh, the uh, one can certainly find all those uh, things in fiction, but one can also find them in the daily news and in every congressional investigation and in every muckraking journalistic investigation that has gone on throughout my lifetime, and I'm 54 now. So when you go back and look at Utopia, I would imagine that in 500 years, whatever, that our ideas of what an ideal society would look like have changed quite a bit. Is that the case, or? Oh, absolutely. Um, the uh... I mean, look at again just at the at the American experiment. Look how limited the franchise, the vote was, uh, in the early days. Um, the 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 idea that uh, that non-property owners would be routinely voting in an unquestioned way would have been horrifying to to so many of those uh, of those uh, original uh, founders, for for lack of a better word. Uh, to their credit, they did like create some fle a flexible document, a constitution that one can keep reinterpreting and adding to. Although one of the great, uh, the great discussions, one of those quintessential American arguments that has been raging, uh, for centuries is how, how much latitude do you get in interpreting those, those original documents? Uh, there are people now on the U.S. Supreme Court who have argued that no regulation of, for example, uh, telecommunications is possible because telecommunications did not exist at the time the Constitution was written, and therefore that, uh, that it is by definition unconstitutional to try to pass any sort of law regarding it whatsoever. And then, and then another view, which I just recently read a monograph from, and I, I will remember after the, after we record this, uh, who wrote it and which law school he's on the faculty of. But uh, his argument is basically, why do we even care whether things are constitutional or not? That this is all beside the point of building a just society, <laughs> and that it can be sort of, uh, sort of disregarded at will. Uh, not that I, I'm no constitutional scholar any more than I am a student of religion, but on the but I do feel that I am somewhere well between those two poles. <laughs> well, I mean, you might not be an expert in religion or politics, but those are clearly both things that interest you a lot. And I've heard you talk about how you kind of took this journey from when you were younger, from a more conservative attitude to both of those, to to a less conservative attitude. Uh, that is a fair assessment. I mean. Throughout one's life, I hope we're always learning and changing and growing, and I certainly have a long ways to go on my way to some millennium. Uh, but yes, I was I was raised uh, a uh, a middle class uh, white straight white boy in uh, rural South Carolina in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, raised by, by two wonderful people, my parents who did so many wonderful things for me, but also were just innately conservative in the sense of better not, uh, more in the sense of caution than of politics. But as part of that, um, it was, it went without question in my upbringing that Strom Thurmond was a heroic statesman, that people like George Wallace and Lester Maddox were to be admired. That anybody that uh, that fought for states' rights and against the grotesque overreach of a uh, of a uh, uh, interventionist meddling federal government um, was uh, was to be uh, to be emulated and admired, and uh, and the the process by which uh, I learned different or realized different was very slow, very piecemeal, very halting. Any number of professors, uh, classmates, girlfriends <laughs> were vital in, 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 in helping me see that the world was a more complex and nuanced place than that. But there's, there's so many factors that have, have played into that. Part of it was that I was a working journalist for years. I was interviewing people from all walks of life, from the top to the bottom, learning how to research things and, and 
find out you find out like on the second day that the things people tell you in all sincerity, even if they believe them to be true, do not necessarily match the historical record or the paper trail or the uh, or the data sets available. Um, so that was certainly a big influence. Um, also, um, just my own teaching experience. Uh, I've, I've been 10 years now at a public university that is between 40 and 50 percent non-white students. And my goodness, the uh, the uh, the fact that uh, that a fifty-something gray-haired white guy's perception of the world is not necessarily the same as a nineteen-year-old African-American uh, queer kid from Baltimore, the way that person sees things is is like a daily revelation to me. And I try to uh, I try to stay open to those daily revelations. I mean, I heard you say that your story from this book, The Map to the Home, Homes of the Stars, is more autobiographical than other things you've written. It certainly is. I, that was written years ago. It was written um, uh, in part, well, in part because Gardner Desois was uh, putting together a an anthology involving, as he put it, sex and ghosts. <laughs> There was a, an erotic supernatural craze going in publishing in the uh, in the nineties, and and I was in grad school and had just sold uh, uh, a couple of stories to Gardner for Asimov's magazine, and uh, and at the time I started that story, um, I was feeling blocked, and I decided, okay, I'm just going to sit down and write something strictly autobiographical. And I'm not going to worry about the fiction thing. I'm just going to recall an episode from my life. And of course, inevitably, two or three days into this happy typing experience, this sort of total recall, I got, uh, I started making things a little better. <laughs> I started sweetening, you know, what had actually happened. And I got to thinking, oh, well, suppose this had happened, or suppose I had said this, or suppose instead of that person being involved, it was this very different person, and how would that have gone? And so the story wound up being made up uh, easily like half of it. Um, uh, needless to say, I did not wind up like <laughs> the narrator, you know, all all alone and sort of haunted by this this the sound of this ghostly car that is driving past at night. But on the other hand, a lot uh, a great deal of that information in there about the two hapless guys just riding around aimlessly for hours and all their behaviors and conversations in the car. That was very much me and Richard O'Malley when we were like 16, 17 years old. Uh, uh, the, uh, like the bit where, where the, the, the owner of the car, the driver is looking for a tape and the tape deck in the back and says, take the wheel. And the passenger is steering for him <laughs> for, for half a mile while he's rummaging among the tapes. We did that more than once. It is a it is it is a wonder that we didn't wind up in a <laughs> ditch and get ourselves killed. But when you're 16 or 17, you uh, you mostly survive things like that unless you don't, of course. Yeah. So these the, these two guys in the story they drive around just kind of passing by the houses of girls in the neighborhood, hoping to just kind of catch a glimpse of them. That's right, because they're so terrified to actually, you know, talk to them and so forth. But, um, oh, but so, so yeah. So I was, re I was reading the story to my girlfriend, and she was asking, "Do you think people still do that, or are they all at home playing video games?" Or <laughs> that's a very interesting question. I don't know. Uh, I know even in and and at the time these things were happening. When did I graduate high school? Nineteen eighty two. So what we're basically talking here is 79, 80, 81. Um, even at that time, was everyone doing that? You know, was everybody a participant in car culture? Well, obviously, if you were, if you were a teenager in Brooklyn at the time, you probably did not have that car culture. If you were riding around aimlessly anywhere, you were riding around on the, on the subway or on the L, you know, or you were taking cabs or something. Um, or you were just, or you were just walking, or, or you were hitching rides or something on the on the expressway. So, uh, so 
there were obviously regional differences even then. But that's a very good question, and if I were teaching high school now, I would may know the answer better. Uh, for my uh, for my undergraduates, it seems like a lot of their uh, activities seem to be focused online, or seem to be focused on like uh, shopping areas, like uh, like like enclosed malls or or sprawls of. of big box stores and so forth where where all the brand names can be found you know they have you know i have all those riding around in the firebird stories and they have starbucks stories they have <laughs> chipotle stories you know uh so so who knows but uh uh, uh whether people in uh, in small towns like i grew up in are still still doing this and and as far as what the young women were doing at the same time that was a mystery, utter mystery to me at age seventeen or eighteen, and still is. So uh, those uh, those young women were getting their licenses too. Where were they driving? You know, were they re- driving past uh, guys' houses, looking longingly out, hoping they would see the guy out washing the car or playing basketball or something? Somehow I doubt <laughs> it. Somehow that seems very much uh, what. Lily Loofborough would call the male gaze. We were practicing our male gaze, sadly, at the time. Well, so there's one part in the story where they um, there's sort of this Christmas display that they drive by, and um, the man is dressed as Santa Claus, I think, and it says, uh, he apologized for having run out of candy canes and instead gave us a couple of three-by-five comic books about hell. <laughs> that absolutely happened, yes, because, because uh, those are the uh, Jack Chick. I had in mind yeah, the yeah. Jack Chick books, which have the cult following now, and you can find them all online, and which were designed to be just like, like uh, uh, to 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 literally scare the hell out of young readers uh, that encountered them at a, at an impressionable age. And sure, if you run, if you run out of candy, you hand out religious tracts. You know, I see that I see that happen all the time. Um, the uh, are religious tracts being handed out at trunk or treat, for example, that uh, that misbegotten practice that is keeping Halloween trick or treaters from our doorsteps, uh, so that now people instead go to church parking lots so they can like go from car truck to car truck uh, with all their fellow parishioners. I guarantee that a lot of religious instruction is getting handed out there. Um, so. Yes, but uh, that 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 is one of those autobiographical parts of that story. I mean, you said in an interview that you were raised in the United Methodist Youth Fellowship, but you've moved, you say, far beyond that. What was that process like? Well, uh, we were we were at church all the time. When the church was open, we were there. Um, my family was. Um, we we uh we lived only a few blocks from the church. It was easy to ride my bike over there. Um uh it was a wonderful it was a wonderful outlet, a safe place for a sort of shy kid to get practice in public speaking and interacting with uh adults and people of all ages and so forth. And the MYF uh in the in the time I was a teenager, when I was in high school. Uh, our church's particularly youth group under uh, Marion and Betty Lewis, who are still with us, and I see uh, Miss Betty on Facebook occasionally. Um, the uh, but for whatever reason, that became like the happening place for teenagers all over town to come hang out in. Uh, and so we had Lutherans, we had Baptists, we had you know people who were not particularly any religion <laughs> at all. Who would come to these events and go to concerts or go to uh, amusement parks for uh, on a Saturday or take camping trips, you know, on the weekend or so forth? And it was uh, I had, I had a lot of fun there. The 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 chief thing I would note about it now, though, before I get too too misty eyed, is uh is that it was absolutely all white, one hundred percent. Because Batesburg was at the time this utterly segregated town, and as Martin Luther King argued years a few years before, that the the hour of church services every Sunday was probably the most segregated hour in American life. Um, 
there Batesburg had Batesburg South Carolina had its black churches and its white churches and my United Methodist congregation was absolutely a white church um once a black person came as a visitor and sat alone in the sanctuary during a church service and a few people said hello and greeted him after the service and then everybody congratulated themselves about it for the next <laughs> five years <laughs> So, so remarkable was this, right? And now I look back and see that that was nothing but utterly bizarre. Right. Well, and I, I could tell that that made a big impression on you because very aggressive displays of racism show up in a lot of these stories. Um, I'll just note um, Joe Diabo's Farewell, Belutha Hachi, The Potawatomi Giant, and Daddy Mentioned in the Monday Skull um, all grapple yep. with that very directly. Yep. John Kessel, one of my perhaps the great mentor I've had in uh, in writing and in the field and in many other things, um, likes to say, you write about what bothers you. And, and that sort of prejudice bothers me a lot. And it perhaps bothers me even more now because it did not bother me at all for the first 20 years of my life. Um, I grapple in these stories with how much I want to depict things like that. If anything, I feel like I sometimes am guilty of pulling my punches. Um, but I'm also conscious of, uh, of just what, what a raw place this is in our national psyche. A lot of people would just prefer not to think about it at all. I always think about <laughs> the, the Lord of Swamp Castle in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, as Michael Palin played him, where he's like trying to make everything nice. And he says, this is supposed to be a <laughs> happy occasion. Let's not, let's not quarrel over who killed who. And a lot of people say that now. Yes, yes, that was all very unpleasant, but let's, let's not talk about it now. Let's just be colorblind. And of course, this is, uh, this does not help at all. Well, you also deal with it in a very, sort of metaphorical way in your story, Senator Bilbo. Could you talk about that? <laughs> yes, that, that, that is one of those stories where the idea comes to you and it seems so obvious that you think, well, obviously, I'm sure someone has done this already. But it turned out no one had because, of course, one of those, uh, before my time, uh, one of those truly uh, septic Southern racist demagogues uh, Theodore Bilbo of Mississippi actually, of course, had the same last name, uh, or, or shared a name, I should say, with Tolkien's, you know, kindly heroic halfling. Um, so you had these like two Bilbos. And at some point I got to thinking, well, suppose these two Bil Bilbos were somehow the same. And I thought, well, surely somebody has dealt with that. So, uh, so that's where. So that's where that story came from. At one point, that was my most published, most reprinted story. It showed up in so many places, so many anthologies. But I think, uh, I think since uh, Close Encounters uh, has uh, has beaten it. But uh, but I was also influenced in writing that by like Michael Moorcock's criticism of Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, for example, with the uh and and i and i uh and people that know uh as much about tolkien as as i don't know about thomas <laughs> more <laughs> have explained to me at some length how uh how uh benighted uh uh Moorcock's, uh interpretation was how he's just misreading tolkien and so forth but but i but it's hard not to miss that like repeated notion in Tolkien that that some races are just worse than others uh, or that some peoples are just worse than others and and this seems to me uh in in the long term if you embrace this too much it 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 it, uh, it has dire consequences for yourself and for and for society uh so so senator bilbo is is a uh, is a a parody uh in which you have this uh this uh 
racist demagogue stopping around the, the world of the halflings uh, and in a sort of desperate holding pattern to try to keep at bay all the change that is coming about as a uh, as a result of what seems to have been uh, the the war of the ring well so in the story uh the senator bilbo character he's thinking about academia in this world and and he thinks to himself in recent years the faculty had got queer eastern notions into their heads in their classrooms muddle-headed claims that all races were close kin that orcs and trolls had not been separately bred by the dark power that the dark power's very existence was mythical and I was just curious. Yep. In, in the, so, in this world, are we supposed to understand that there was no dark lord, or, or was there? Well, the uh, well, well. Think about it. Think about it this way. Um, I'm not questioning that uh, in this uh, in this sort of this uh, parodic Middle Earth like setting that I am imagining. Um, I'm not questioning that uh, that there was a Sauron uh, any more than I I'm not denying all that bloodshed and all that wickedness that needed to be beaten back any more than I would be in our world a Holocaust denier. On the other hand, uh, I can easily imagine that a lot of those people that were doing the Dark Lord's bidding were doing so out of simple self-preservation and so forth. Uh, that, uh, that a lot of those uh, uh, creatures that were sort of raised out of the earth by Saruman and so forth had not a great deal of choice in the matter about what to do. Uh, so I have this like very complicated sense of, of, of the politics of all that. Um, and I have read a lot about, uh, the difficulties with, with reconciliation efforts, you know, in the wake of genocides in, uh, various places around the world. As, as a writer, I greatly admire Jeff Ryman has extensively, you know, read about and participated in these efforts and written about them. Um, and and so I'm just I and and it is easier to demonize one's opponents than to try to understand them and understand the complex forces that are leading, for example, to refugees cro trying to cross one's southern border legally or illegally. Um, uh, it is easier just to build walls and denounce them as scum and 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 rally the uh, the good folks of the Shire against them. <laughs> uh, one reviewer, Gary Wolf, said that Senator Bilbo, if anything, seems like more of a relevant story now than it did when it first was published in the Starlight Three anthology years ago. Uh, it seems to me, it seems less a pastiche and more of a sort of a, sort of a dire warning. Well, I completely agree that. Reading this story now, it's hard to keep in mind that it wasn't written as a response to events happening this year or last year, sure. I mean, down to the fact that Senator sure. Bilbo is running on the Shire First ticket. Um, <laughs> That's right. I had forgotten that. You're right. Uh, make the Shire great again, basically. Um, but but uh, this, um, yes, in many ways, President Trump is is unique. But in many ways, we have seen his like before, not just in other countries, but in our country, the different parts of our country. Um, we have seen the forces that he has tapped into on the ascendancy before. This is not reassuring. This does not mean that we do not have a problem. But problems recur. Problems are cyclical. Um, and, uh, and the resistance must be cyclical, too. Uh, as, as Tolkien well knew, the war is never quite, the war is never quite over. And it has a tendency to, uh, to show up right there in your own, uh, right there in your own hometown when you're least expecting it. Right. I also want to ask you about this story, Close Encounters. It's about, uh, sort of a UFO abductee and the sort of UFO culture. Were you ever, uh, 
What, what, what's your interest in, in UF, UFO abduction? Uh, when I was a kid, I, uh, I got fascinated by every book I could find at the library that was about flying saucers, the Loch Ness Monster, Jack the Ripper, uh, the Bermuda Triangle, uh, which I now realize was sort of invented as a trope when I was a kid. <laughs> I was one of the first people reading about it. Uh, all this stuff fascinated me. Uh, all these odd pockets of history and, and the paranormal or of pseudoscience. What I now think of is Fortiana. I mean, I know the Ripper actually existed, but when you, the moment you start reading about the Ripper, you realize that, you know, for a century, you know, hundreds of devotees have been developing rich fantasies about who the Ripper was and so on and so forth. So, so really it's as much as a, a field of play as Roswell is. Okay. But as a kid, I read all this stuff. I just drank it in with complete credulity and conviction, of course. And once I started getting older and started exercising a little common sense, which is not so common even <laughs> in me. And, and also, uh, uh, started learning, started reading people like Carl Sagan. Uh, I got to realize all the ways that, um, these don't really hold water as logical ways to explain the world. But my goodness, they still work as myths, as like modern explorations of the things that bother us in John Kessel's words again. And so for that reason, and because it's great story material, I continue to read a lot of this stuff. I'm a devoted reader of the Fortean Times out of the UK. Uh, my shelves grown with, uh, with, uh, books on all these subjects. And, uh, and it was an article in the, the Fortean Times about the, uh, uh, not the abductees, but the contactees, uh, because UFOlogy has gone in waves, of course. Uh, and there was the wave in the 50s and 60s of the people that claimed to have not been abducted, but sort of like happily waved, invited into the spaceship to visit the Space Brothers and see Earth from their point of view and so forth and come back with these wonderful welcoming messages about the, uh, the, the great souls of the galaxy who were welcoming us to join them. Uh, and these folks are easy to, to make fun of, but, uh, they also are speaking to some sort of, you know, again, utopian ideal on the fringes of American society in particular. And I just find them endlessly, uh, uh endlessly fascinating. Uh, but, uh, and so, but one of them, one of the, uh, lesser known contactees was this Ozark farmer named Buck Nelson. And there was a poignant black and white photograph of him in his overalls holding a handmade sign, you know, come to the saucer picnic or whatever. And I just immediately thought, okay, a lot of these California cultist type people I can't identify with. But look at Buck Nelson there. I know Buck Nelson. <laughs> I grew up with many of Buck Nelson. I know exactly how he would. And the whole story like sprang from that. I mean, there's a character in the story named Dr. Rutledge, and there's a part, part where he says, yes. like Hynek, like Valley and Maccabee, I am trying to establish these researches as a serious scientific discipline. Are yes. those real figures? Yes. Oh, absolutely. J. Allen Hynek. And uh, who was the second Valley, one? Again? It's Valley or Valet. Oh, uh, Jacques, Jacques Valet, yes. Uh, Valet is still with us. Uh, Hynek died years ago. But there was just a pretty good biography of, uh, that came out uh, about Hynek. Uh, and, uh, and Maccabee I met uh, at, at some Fortean gathering in, uh, in Baltimore years ago. Uh, David Drake was there. He and I talked to, uh, to Bruce Maccabee. Um, uh, there, there, there was a group of, of UFologists who argued not that we should all like, uh, you know, go sit under pyramids and chant to the Space Brothers, but that there was some genuine scientific phenomenon going on there that we were missing, that we were asking the wrong questions, that we should bring our intelligence and our various disciplines to bear on. And I find that, I find that a very compelling thing. 
but obviously, and and uh, and uh, the uh, and Rutledge is inspired by the actual Dr. Rutledge, who was actually doing these sorts of researches in the Ozarks at the time in the 1970s. Um, but obviously, that goes on a collision course with the the belief system of the people like Buck Nelson, who say that this is not something to apply one's calipers to, but this is a, a, an epiphany to be experienced. And you are experiencing it wrongly if you are subjecting it to all these like scientific measurements and, and, and frameworks. It's, it's precisely the attitude a, a devout believer in Catholic miracles would would feel if their veneration of a uh, of a weeping Madonna uh, or, or some sort of miraculous statue, which you have not just in Catholicism but in Hinduism and a lot of other faiths, uh, it would be exactly the same as the reaction they would have to uh, to the scientists showing up uh, and saying, "Okay, let's uh, let's you know, do some tests of the tears here." <laughs> And see if it's actually the the ingredients of human tears, or if it's something like you know the groundwater seeping through the wall of the gro underground grotto, or something like that. I mean, people don't take very well to that sort of scientific interpretation of what they consider to be a genuine experience. Well, and the Buck Nelson character in the story has traveled to the moon, and it's been a very sort of pulp era science fiction version of the moon with you know beautiful women and sure um and uh and there's something very um sad about that 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 stuff didn't turn out to be true i think that still sort of echoes through science fiction today oh absolutely it does um before his his untimely death gardner Desois, another of my friends and mentors in the field, uh, he actually co-edited a couple of anthologies. One was titled, I think, Old Mars, and one was Old Venus, which were uh, explicitly set on the uh, Mars and Venus of the planetary romance before we before we scienced the hell out of them and actually found out what the real life Mars and the real life Venus uh, were like. Now, of course, the real life Mars still has a lot of storytelling potential ask stan robinson ask andy weir um ask uh, uh mary kowal but but the uh but obviously it's a very different terrain from the mars that lee brackett and edgar rice burroughs were writing about um the the great transition figure there being ray bradbury with the martian chronicles where you know he's like saying goodbye to that fabled Mars of his childhood uh, that uh, that in the post-war era was becoming uh, a much less exotic, much less habitable space. Uh, but I think I think that sort of uh, that sort of nostalgia for worlds lost is behind it percolates through a lot of 21st century science fiction. Um, I don't think it's universal. I don't think everybody is worried about that. But I think there is a, is a, a lot of, um, I think there is some longing, not necessarily just for those uh, lost worlds, uh, which could, after all, still exist, I suppose, as exoplanets that are now being discovered, but certainly a nostalgia for all that uh, era of human space exploration, um, uh, and and what the uh, what the Gemini and Apollo and Mercury programs you know turned into. So why do you think, out of all your stories, that the Close Encounters story is the one that's been reprinted the most? That's a that's a that's a very useful question, and I have pondered that. Um, it got such good reviews. It was in so many years best volumes. And, uh, and it not only was at, on the nebula, it was not only on a number of awards ballots, as other stories had been, but it actually won me the nebula. Uh, I had been a, a nominee, a finalist many times for the nebula, and it finally won. So, of course, not being insensible to these things, 
I am a sensitive dreamer, but I'm also a practical <laughs> person. I try to be. So I went and I reread the story at some point, consciously thinking, okay, what does this story have that some of my other stories that I was very proud of did not have? And yes, as you're indicating, it has a lot of that. Uh, uh, it both has that that rural, folksy, tall tale sort of yarn spinning voice that that uh, I get honest, as my grandmother would say, the way I grew up, and that is sort of a natural default for me in fiction that people really respond to, and yet it simultaneously had all of this outer space and, and space program mixed emotions yearning, uh, the, the science versus the, the scientific romance, the fantasy of it. So it had all that. But I decided when I reread it that what it mainly had going for it was an absolute strong three-act structure, <laughs> <laughs> which I do not find a lot in my other stories. But but Act One, the uh, the visitor, the stranger walks in. The the visitor interrupts the hermit's hermitage, gets him thinking about all this stuff again. It's the the trigger. Uh, act Two. The, uh, the, the protagonist acts on this new, new awareness. You know, what has he been triggered to do? So he ventures out and tries to make <laughs> contact, not with the entities again, but with the scientists. And it does not come out the way anybody planned. Then act three, he's back home. How has this changed him? Uh, what has, what is going to be his future now? And, uh, and if I were teaching that story in a class, I could like, you know, you could you could practically chart out, you know, the outline of uh, Act 1, 2, 3 there. Uh, exactly the same way Nancy Kress was trying to get us to do at Clarion West back in 1994, <laughs> telling us that all stories should have beginnings, middles, and ends. Well, that's one of mine that has a very, I think, clear-cut beginning, middle, and end. Um that a lot of my uh, more experimental or more loosey goosey or more one damn thing after another structures do not have, and I think people respond to that to that story structure. It's funny, you know. I, I started reading the story, and instantly I I recognized it that I had heard you read it years ago at the KGB bar. And yes. um, mm -hmm. you know, it's not obviously every story I hear that that sticks in my mind that way. So there's there's definitely something to that. And of course, you, you read very well. I mean, this is um, widely commented on. But um, I saw in an interview, you said, I often write this story with perform with the performance in mind. And I was wondering if you could just talk about how is a story different uh, if you're thinking about performing it out loud? Well, I I do get asked to do to do readings and have been for many years. And a lot of a lot of excellent writers a lot of brilliant writers just don't think much about the readings they either do as little of them as they can or they do none uh, uh ted chang who is brilliant has always been very resistant to do readings of his his own work um the uh but i guess in part because i grew up in something of an oral culture where we're holding the floor as a preacher, as a politician, as a storyteller at a family gathering was, was simply expected, was, was one route to, to success, acceptance, validation, what have you. Uh, also my community, community theater background of ham acting. Ever since I started writing fiction as opposed to journalism and nonfiction, I've been like reading it out loud to myself as I go. And initially, it was more like sort of accidentally realizing, oh, hey, this would be a really good 15-minute segment to read because it's important to, I'd always tell my Clarion and Clarion West students that young writers, novice writers, need to be thinking in terms of, you know, okay, if you're asked to do a five-minute reading, if you're asked to do a 20-minute reading, what are you going to do? It's not It's not good enough just take one of your long stories and try to read it really, really, really <laughs> fast. Because then, because that doesn't work, and you can't like take a flash piece and read it really, really, really slowly, and fill twenty minutes either. So it's useful to be thinking sort of modular as you're as you're writing, and 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 if you get a scene with a 
sort of rising and falling action, a beginning, middle, and end within that within that scene. And it and it ends with a bang and it has some laugh lines. You know, you think to yourself, or I do, I think, okay, I'm gonna try this out, see how it works in my mouth. Because all my favorite fiction writers, indeed, pretty much all my favorite writers, period, are the ones that reward reading aloud. Because that is a way of saying, okay, we're not just interested here in what happens. We're interested in how it's told. We're interested in the in the in the sound of the sentences, the the roll and tumble and the pitch of the words, the the flow of the language, and and that's what I've always been drunk on as a reader. So I'm glad I can provide that experience for for my readers too. Well, right, that's exactly what I was about to say. Is that usually when I give advice to people on giving a reading, I recommend that they keep it short and that it be funny and have a lot of dialogue. And sure. I think that works well for most people, but you're able to read pieces that have these long paragraphs, long sentences, and it still works. Uh, it still holds the uh, the listener's interest. There was a, uh, I have so, so many, uh, so many models there. I mean, uh, the opening to, uh, to Robert Penn Warren's All the King's Men which is this long hypothetical about the straight road that they're driving through in Louisiana, uh, the governor and his men. And it's talking about how at any moment the, the tire might blow and they might. And there's this long hypothetical car wreck into the ditch and, and it just rolls and rolls and rolls and gets more and more impassioned. And then the next paragraph begins. But this d- did not happen. <laughs> and then, yeah, it just picks up from there. Uh, but you get that in Eudora Welty. You get uh, all that dialogue-rich stuff in uh, in Flannery O'Connor. You certainly get it in Zora Neale Hurston. So many of like the formative Southern writers uh, that helped make me. Um, you have this sort of orality throughout. Uh, they're not all writing the same. They're certainly not all the same. The same perspective. The same voice. But they, they, they all privilege that sort of, that, that if you, that if you get the right cadences and you've picked the right words and your sense of timing is acute enough, that you can sort of get away with it, get away with anything. And I think that works too when you're doing a reading. The, the best performers I've seen of their own work, people like Elizabeth Hand and Neil Gaiman, for example, uh, uh, are just, you get the sense that they could read anything. Uh, uh, I, the, my voice, people, I mean, I, I'm sure it annoys some people and they're kind enough not to tell me. But so many people have told me through the years that they like my accent or they like hearing me talk. But, uh, the funny story we always tell is that a few years ago, my wife and I were at a restaurant and I was looking at the menu and the, the server, the woman comes up. And I, uh, my, uh, I tell her what I want to order. Instead of writing it down, she just clasped the, uh, notepad to her bosom and she sort of rocked back and forth and smiled and she said, I could listen to you talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife, and I didn't know what to say, but my wife knew exactly what to say. She was still intently looking at her menu and she said, be careful what you <laughs> wish for. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's that's the that's the response that my my voice sometimes gets so I try to I try as I'm writing these things to have the voice be part of it because even if I never get the chance to perform it as like 95% of the pages in this book I've never gotten the chance um but I hope that my focus on that conveys some of that even to the reader who's just encountering it uh, cold on an ebook or something. Well, and I just want to mention in passing that if you're a fan of some of the Southern writers that you mentioned, like Flannery O'Connor or um, also uh, Zora Neale Hurston, you mentioned that um, they appear as characters in this book, so you can meet them as characters. <laughs> well, yes, that's true. I, I forgot about that. But yes, they're, they're such influences that they show up as characters. Yeah, so... Um, Definitely everyone check those out. We're pretty much out of time. So I guess, Andy, do you want to just tell us, um, is there, do you have any other just final thoughts you want to mention? Or do you have any other projects coming out that you want to let people know about? 
several things uh, coming up. I mean, I'm always working on stuff, and who knows uh, when they get finished and when they get published. The, the timeline is sometimes out of my hands. But I know that I've got a short story titled Mr. Percy's Shortcut showing up in a Cat Rambo anthology that's coming out in the spring of 2019. The anthology is titled If This Goes On, a set of overtly uh, political science fiction stories. Um, I've got a novelette uh, titled uh, Charlie Tells Another One coming out in Asimov Science Fiction in 2019 in the, uh, um, I believe, the September-October issue, the, the Halloween issue, the somewhat spooky issue, uh, because of their... There is supernatural stuff at work there. Um, I am also, uh, because we are heading into uh, uh, submission season for the Clarion and Clarion West workshops, I should mention that I'm teaching the fourth, scheduled to teach the fourth week of Clarion at UC San Diego in summer 2019, and would uh, and would encourage anyone who. Uh, who is interested in applying to those workshops to do so. Um, uh, and uh, basically, um, any, uh, I guess, I, I guess that's the, that's the highlights that I can, that I can think of coming up. I heard you said that the publisher is going to send copies of that. If this goes on anthology into Congress, I don't know if that was a joke or not, but. No, that was that was the that was the plan. The publisher told me at Worldcon when I when I saw him that uh, that that was still the plan to get a copy into every office on uh, Capitol Hill and the Oval Office. Um, now, how exactly that's going to work logistically, I'm not, I don't know, but uh, but I think it's a it's a very uh, it's a very interesting uh, interesting idea. Uh, Parvis Press, which is a, a small press that is, uh, that is new, is doing this, doing this project and they have some, some very, uh, interesting ideas. I, uh, I love all the, the, I love that so many small presses are percolating up all over the place, taking advantage of the, the technologies now. Um, and all these new people that I'm meeting at the conventions and on the circuit and so forth. Um, uh, a lot of them are now in touch with me all the time on uh, on social media. Uh, I can be found pretty easily on Twitter at Belutha Hatchie. Uh, I'm on Facebook too, um, and uh, and people I don't even know will like message me and say, you know, you don't know me, but I read your this or that interview, or I or I was in the audience when you did so and so. And they're basically just looking for encouragement, and I'm happy to encourage them. <laughs> uh, new writers, new publishers, new editors. It's all great, whether they're my students or not. I'm always happy to uh, to hear from them. But yeah, that's the plan with uh, with uh, the uh, uh, if this goes on, but to get uh, to get uh, copies to the decision makers, and maybe now that the U.S. House is changing hands. Uh, thanks to uh, to the the recent election midterms, um, who knows? Maybe that book will uh, will uh, will get read more widely than it would have before. <laughs> yeah, I definitely hope that happens because I think everyone should be reading more science fiction and politicians, uh, especially. Yes, I always want to ask everybody running for office, even at the school board level, who is your science advisor? <laughs> <laughs> where do you, where do you get your science information? I mean, often the answer is nobody and nowhere. Um, I think that would more often be the case than not. But but we don't have a single problem facing us that we we are not going to need a lot of science and a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise to help us think our way think our way around. I'm not a complete technocrat. I do not believe that every problem has some magical uh, scientific lever. But I do know that uh, that if we're uh, acting in ignorance of what the science tells us, then we are then we are doomed, uh, pretty much. Uh, and I don't like to think we're doomed. Uh, I don't go from day to day thinking that we're doomed. That would not be a way forward, as far as I'm concerned, as a writer or as anything else. So I remain hopeful. 
So I'm happy to take part in the, you know, keep writing this stuff, keep publishing it. Because you never know who's reading it now that might be in a position to really accomplish something tomorrow or five years or 50 years hence. And who knows how that thing you wrote uh, is going to affect them long term. Who knows? Uh, all us writers might be changing the world for the better without even realizing it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so I think that's a good note to end on. So we've been speaking with Andy Duncan about his new short story collection, An Agent of Utopia. So, Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Andy Duncan for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.